16 battles, 15 skirmishes, over 100 duels, didn't receive a single cut himself, severely wounded 27 times, and he still lived to be an old man. These are just some of the experiences of the legendary 18th century Highland swordsman called Donald McBain. In September of this year, I was honoured to attend a HEMA event that celebrates this man's life and martial teachings. And although everyone in this niche community knew who McBain was, hardly anyone in the wider public has ever heard of him. So to rectify this, in this video we sit around the fire and tell some of our favourite stories from this man's life. So get comfy and let the stories begin. Hi folks, Tom for Van Dyke Dilsey, thanks for tuning in, joined once again by my apprentice Jason. Now, if you're new to the channel, I like to make videos about a bunch of different topics, but mainly around the topics of wilderness survival skills and martial arts, often from a historical perspective. And what I love so much about these topics is how it forces you to simplify life right down to its absolute basics, giving you strong foundations and resilience from which you can build everything else in life from. Now this word resilience, the ability to just keep going no matter what, is uh, definitely a theme for today's video when we're looking at this guy's life. So for context, this past September I was honoured to be a guest speaker and instructor at this year's McBain event in Edinburgh hosted by the Cat's Glove School of Traditional Defence as well as McDonald's Armouries. And you've seen Paul McDonald on this channel before and it was an epic weekend. Um, loads of really interesting workshops. Our friend Ben from Source of Swords was also there teaching a, a, a workshop on staff uh, self-defense. Um, the social was amazing. Got involved in a good pub crawl on the Saturday night. Met loads of lovely people. We got to visit the National Library of Scotland and we actually got to, to hold some actual swords from the time period. One of which was the actual sword of Rob Roy McGregor. Uh, that, that was pretty epic. special, that was epic. Mm. So the McBain event is basically a historical European martial art event celebrating the life and teachings of the legendary Highland swordsman known as Donald McBain. Now obviously people at the event knew who McBain was. Lots of people who are interested in Scottish martial history know who he was. But I found when I was trying to describe the event to, to friends and family no one really knew who he was. You know, these are people from Scotland. Lots of people haven't heard from him, which I think is a, is a real shame. So near the end of McBain's life, he wrote a book called The Expert Swordsman's Companion. And in the book, he shares a bunch of different techniques and fighting systems using different weapons. And he also shares a brief account about his life and shares loads of stories from his various military campaigns and different duels. And simply put, this guy's life was absolutely insane. Uh, you know, he was kind of like the Chuck Norris of 18th century Scotland. Um, and they should really make a movie about this guy's life. It would make a great movie. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, it's a shame that not more people know about him. Especially here in Scotland. So I thought that I'd dedicate the next couple of videos for the channel just looking at McBain's life and his martial teachings. So in this video, I thought I'd introduce Donald McBain, a bit about who he was, some of our favourite stories about his military campaigns and his duels, using some of the overlays from the McBain event that we attended in Edinburgh. So Donald McBain was a Highlander born in Inverness in the year 1664. His father made a living from a small farm and owning a pub. And McBain describes his childhood of him being a bit of a wild child, always getting up to mischief. So his father decided to put him to a trade. Um, so his father made him go work at a tobacco spinner in Inverness. But uh, this wasn't for McBain. So at the age of 23, he decided to join the army. This being the British army, otherwise known as the Redcoats. Now at this sort of time period in Scottish history, around the Jacobite Risings, people often overly simplify it as Scotland versus England or the free Highlanders versus the oppressive government. But like everything in history, it's it's always much more complicated. 
and lots of Highlanders were in the British Army because, you know, it was a steady job, probably one of the few steady jobs at the time, and no doubt they were lured in by some recruitment officer telling them that it was a chance to go on adventures around the world. Nothing's changed. Nothing's <laughs> changed, yes. So anyway, he joined the army and throughout his military career, he fought in the Highlands, France, Flanders, Germany and Holland. He took part in 16 battles, 15 skirmishes, over 100 duels. <laughs> During all this, he was severely wounded at least 27 times. One of this time was when he blew himself up with his own hand grenade. And before I read some of our favourite stories, I think it's important to first say that we're not trying to romanticise McBain's moral character. And I think he would agree with this if you look at some of the writings and poems later in this book, when he says, when he talks about the shame for the sins he committed and to repent for his wickedness, as he says, as, you know, Donald McBain, he made his living from not only being a soldier and from teaching sword fighting, but everywhere he went, he made most of his money by setting up gambling tents and brothels. So just being in the nature of fighting, gambling and the sex trade, he had to face a lot of evil and do a lot of evil. But why I think it's important to tell McBain's story is that not only am I interested in martial arts, and McBain is considered to be one of the best fencing masters of the 18th century, but I'm also inspired by McBain's just sheer ability to keep going, his sheer survival will, his will to survive. Every time he's wounded or left for dead in the battlefield, he has this just unreal ability to just <laughs> recover and get right back into the fray. <laughs> it's proper McBain energy. Also, some of the stories are quite frankly hilarious. Uh, Again, it would make a great movie if someone out there has got a few million dollars, a few million pounds to throw into a movie budget. There's some good ideas in here. We were talking it would be great to act out some sketches for some of these stories, but we thought in the meantime, let's just sit by fire and yeah, and read them out. Shall we get into it? Yeah. So the first battle he was involved in was the Battle of Mulroy in 1688. Now, this battle's interested me before because it's the last time bows and arrows were used in a battlefield in Britain. Uh, he doesn't mention bows and arrows here, but uh, yeah, we know by, know by other records that they were used. Now this was basically a land dispute between the McDonalds and the Macintosh. And um, basically the land was recognised by the British government to own by the Macintoshes. So the British government supported them. So he's on the Macintosh side fighting against McDonald's. And here is what he said. The two clans was both on foot and our company was still with the Macintosh who marched towards McDonald and his clan until we came within sight of them, which made me wish I had been spinning tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying how scared he is the first time he sees he comes up against the enemy. Macintosh sent one of the friends to the Macdonald to treat with him and see if they would come to some reasonable terms. Macdonald directly denied and would fight and would fight it be to the event it would. This is, obviously this is written in Old English so it's, it's quite hard to read some of it. Basically he denied uh, any terms. Then both parties ordered the men to march up the hill. A company being in the front, we drew up in the line of battle as we could. Our company being on the right, we were no sooner in order, but there appears double the number of McDonald's, which made us then fear the worst, at least for my part. I repeated my former wish, I never having seen the like. <laughs> so basically, last minute, double the number of McDonald's turn up. The McDonald's came down the hill upon us without neither shoe, stocking or bonnet on their head. They gave a shout, and then a fire began on both sides and continued a hot dispute for an hour. They then broke upon us with their sword and targe and lock axes, which obliged us to give way. <laughs> Seeing my captain sore wounded, and a great many more with heads lying cloven on every side, I was sadly affrighted, never having seen the like before. 
A Highland man attacked me with sword and targe and cut my wooden handled bayonet out of the muzzle of my gun. I then clubbed my gun and gave him a stroke with it, which made the butt end fly off. <laughs> Seeing the Highland man come fast upon me, I took to my heels and ran 30 miles before I looked behind me. So, that was Big Bane's wow. first battle. Uh, so they were defeated. Um, this is their early musket bayonets or plug bayonets. Terrible design. It's a wooden plug that you shove in. Highland man just knocked it straight out. <laughs> and then he tried to hit him with the butt of the, of the gun and it broke. Um, and he ran. So that was his first ever battle. And his second ever battle wasn't much better. So this is the Battle of Killy Cranky. Again, he's on the side of the British Army fighting against Highlanders. When they advanced, we played our cannon for an hour upon them. The sun going down caused the Highland men to advance on us like madmen, without shoe or stocking, covering themselves from the fire with their targes. At the last moment, they cast away their muskets and drew their broadswords and advanced furiously upon us and were in the middle of us before we could fire three shots apiece, broke us and obliged us to retreat. Some fled to the water, and some another way. I fled to the baggage and took a horse in order to ride to the water. There follows me a highland man with sword and targe, in order to take the horse and kill myself. You'd laugh to see how he and I scrambled about, I keeping the horse between me and him. At length, he drew his pistol, and I fled. He fired after me. I went over the pass, where I met another water very deep. It was about eight foot over, between two rocks. I resolved to jump it, so I laid down my gun and hat, and jumped, and lost one of my shoes in the jump. Many of our men was lost in the water of that pass. The enemy pursued hard, and I made the best of my way to Dunkel. Now this is actually, you can go to the Battle of Kaylee Cranky and it's called the Soldier's Leap. And I remember visiting this when I was a kid and there's a little plaque that's got a depiction of uh, a red coat leaping. It's huge, eight feet. It looks further than eight feet. Leaping over this pass to escape from the Highlanders. That guy was Donald McBain. <laughs> I remember, I went there when I was like 10 years old and was think I was inspired by that story and it was McBain. But again, not a very... Um, Honourable fight. He was <laughs> on the losing side. Uh, yeah. So that's that's the first two um, first two battles of Donald McBain. So it wasn't until a few years into McBain's military career did he start getting into sword fighting. Did he start to learn fencing. But rather than me telling the story of his first duel, why don't we let Paul McDonald from McDonald Armories tell the story. Over to you, Paul. Well, this was, uh, it wasn't his first taste of battle. He'd already fought uh, the Battle of Mulroy in 1688, and then the Battle of Killy Cranky in 1689. So 1690, the year after, he's uh, uh, in Fort William, building Fort William, building the actual fort. And um, it was a couple of years after that, he had a fallout with an old soldier who was put in charge of his pay. And the old soldier wasn't giving him all his pay, just what he thought he needed to get by. And McBain thought, well, I'll have to deal with this and deal with it myself. And so he called the boy out with the sword. He didn't even have a sword himself. He borrowed it from a friend. He borrowed a small sword. And he challenged the old boy who sat outside. And with the broad sword in the hand of the old soldier against the small sword, in the, at that time, untrained, inexperienced Donald McBain. McBain was uh, disarmed pretty quickly. And the old boy smacked him with the flat of the sword, you know, and said... Don't bother me again, you know. Um, but that's where Donald McBain chose to go back to take lessons in the small sword against the broad sword, quite specifically, to know how to defeat it. And um, he went back, he borrowed another small sword, and he challenged the old fellow again. And the old fellow was, he was bent on taking an arm or a leg off him at this point. And um, I they went out the back, and the boy, the old soldier, his blood's up and he's making quite hefty cuts and wide cuts. And McBain was taught to keep his distance and just time the moments between the cuts with a thrust, and he thrust him in the body. And then the boy tried to cut him again. He thrust him in the leg to stop him running away and disarmed him with his broadsword and said, I'll be master of all my pay from now on. You know, and I think he d dedicated a big part of his heart to 
the art of the sword after that. Now one of the first stories I want to share from McBain's military campaign um, is actually one of the first times he gets severely wounded when he blows himself up with his own hand grenade. Uh, now basically they're fighting the French and they're attacking some forts and they've been told not to take any prisoners but he spares the life of a, a French officer he comes across and uh, in return for sparing his life the French officer shows, shows him where they've got a bunch of money basically. So this is where our story begins. He gave me 11 bags of the money for saving his life. I made all speed I could to my company where they were tumbling over the wall the carcasses that were loaded with hand grenades. I took up one of them with design to throw it amongst the enemy but it prevented me and broke in my hands and killed severals about me. It blew me over the palisade, burnt my clothes about me so my, my skin came off me. I and my gold fell amongst Murray's company of grenadiers. Fled like old dead horses from head to foot, they cast me into the water to put out the fire about me. So yeah, so the hand grenade went off his hand, burnt him severely. Uh, he talks about some other things that went on in the battle, but this is how they, they treated him. I lay at my whole length in oil for 20 days. Three weeks. Three weeks they, they laid them in a bath of oil to cure his burns. They opened my mouth with a knife and poured oil or milk. I was all this time blind. They killed two young dogs and plied their lights warm to my eyes, which took the heat out of my eyes in 24 hours. So Jason and I have been talking, what does that actually mean? Yeah, either, I'm thinking maybe either plying something off of the dogs and applying them while it's still warm to him. Applying your lights. Or, or applying, but yeah, it's written plying. Yeah, it's applying, yeah. Mm. So we wonder if they pulled the eyes out of the dog and put it on his eyes to like <laughs> cure his eyes. <laughs> like cucumbers. Like cucumbers. <laughs> McBain Spa. And they fed him a broth, strong broth and wine. So that, that alone should take you out of the fight for the rest of your life. But not McBain. He went... He was only recovering for a few months and he was back in the battlefield. The next story I want to share is quite a funny one. It's uh, one about McBain sleeping in as his army retreats <laughs> and he gets captured. It's quite a funny story. So next day we marched to Santry, Santroy. We, we were two or three nights in camp by the way. We had an alarm that the enemy was near to us, which obliged our army to march to Santry. The night before our march, I was up all night. When I came to my tent, I fell asleep. My comrades could not wake me. So they took away my tent and my arms, except my sword. They cast some straw over me and left me, never thinking to see me again. <laughs> <laughs> up comes a French dragoon, seeking plunder, and took me prisoner. He took my sword from me, which swore against my will. He drave me before him until he came to a wood site where he was to ease his nature. Basically, he needed a pee. <laughs> he, he alighted and took a pistol with him, commanding me to hold his horse. When his breeches was down, I mounted his horse and rode for it. He cried and fired after me. The bullet came through my hair and cap and grazed my head. I loosed my sword from that it was ties to the saddle, and with it I whipped the horse. He cried in French, Stop! Stop that English rogue! A great many wives were before which cast stones at me, which obliged me to ride faster, <laughs> <laughs> until I came to the front where our royal regiment was. When my captain saw me, he was amazed, saying he never thought to see me again. I told him the whole story, and... It pleased him well. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, McBain was up all night, probably drinking, uh, and he was so hungover that he slept in as his <laughs> army retreats and they take the tent with him to put some straw on him and leave him. Uh, yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> Next story is a pretty dark one, to be honest. So again, they're fighting the French, and this is a big battle. In the village, there was of French 36 battalions of foot and six regiments of dragoons. We cannonaded on the village until 
we burnt it about their ears. When we attacked, we were beat several times, with great loss. At last, we took them all prisoners. They laid down their arms and marched a mile to the right of our army. We took a great many of their head officers and standers, tents, and their whole train of ammunition. In the attacks we made upon the French, I was shot four times with ball in several parts of my body and five times stabbed with a bayonet. bayonet. It says stabbed, not stabbed. So he was shot four times and stabbed five times. And I was left <laughs> among the dead. About the middle of the night, the Dutch of our, our army came to plunder and stripped me all except my shirt. A little after came another and took that shirt also. I besought him to leave me it, but he gave me a stroke with the butt of his gun because I was not quick enough to pull it off. Thus I was left in a deplorable condition. A little after that, the ground took fire. I crept upon a dead man until the fire had passed me. Then I fell off him and lay among the dead, expecting death every minute. Not only by the reason of wounds, but by the reason of cold and the great thirst I had. I drank several handfuls of dead men's blood I lay beside. The more I drank, the worse I was. I continued until daylight. Then came a sergeant and soldier of our company looking for wounded men of our company. When the sergeant saw me, he cast his coat on me, and they carried me on their shoulders to the village where the wounded and surgeons were. They gave me water to drink, which caused me to vomit the blood I drank. I got my wounds dressed. Then they gave me a dram, which I received. <laughs> <laughs> so, shot four times, stabbed with a bayonet five times, left for dead. The Dutch, who were actually on his side, came and took, <laughs> took his clothes, took everything, left them for dead. A brush fire was caused, probably by someone in the battle. He climbed on a dead man to get away from the fire. He was dying of cold and thirst, so he drank the blood of soldiers around him, uh, which he later vomited up. Metal as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, like, he just says, and they gave me a dram, which I received. <laughs> I received that dram. So another story, which is both dark and a little bit funny, is when McBain uh, had to take his baby son into the front line battlefield in a haversack. Um, so this is the story. So basically they're getting ready to besiege a village that is being occupied by the French as, and he's just forming up to, to march into battle. I had two children at this time. Our wives were far in the rear. My wife gave my little boy to a comrade's wife who had a horse. The woman Hearing her husband was dead, she rode until she saw me in the front of the line. She then threw the boy at me. Then, <laughs> then I was obliged to put him in my haversack. He was about three years of age. As we were inclined to the right, the boy got a shot in the arm. I, I then got a surgeon to dress it. I had neither bread nor drink to give him. I got a dram for him from an officer <laughs> and a leg of fowl. Then he held his peace and was very quiet all night. In the morning, his mother took him from me. So essentially, yeah, a friend's wife was looking after the child. She found out that her husband was dead and was didn't want to look after his child anymore. She saw him on the front line, <laughs> throws him this child, and uh, he was about to go to battle, so he just stuck him in his haversack. And they said, we were inclined to the right, and he got a shot in the arm. I'm not really sure what that means. But anyway, it seems like the three-year-old boy got a shot in the arm, and the surgeon patched him up, gave him a dram, <laughs> and a leg of fowl to shut him up. <laughs> Insane. So we'll tell one final story. From McBain's many stories <coughs> of his uh, his battles. Again, these are just some of our favourites. He's got many. In the year 1709, we took the field and laid siege to the city of Turney and the Citadel. 
I was one of the besiegers at the Citadel. While we were breaking ground and erecting batteries, they fired very hard upon us with their cannons. But we soon made them keep their heads down with the storm from our outer work in the night time and took them. And before day, we cast a trench to shelter ourselves. When they saw what we had done, they planted a gun directly on our flank through the wall. With one shot, they killed 48 men. I escaped the shot, but one of the heads of the men that was shot knocked me down, and all his brains came around my head. I, being half senseless, put up my hand to my head, and finding the brains, cried to my neighbour that all my brains were knocked out. And he said, were your brains out, then you couldn't speak. When our gunders <laughs> spied where the shot came from, they directed the whole battery against the place and beat down the wall and dismounted the gun before they could fire again. So, he's besieging a fort, uh, they, they dig a trench to shelter themselves from the enemy, but at night, the face of the enemy, position a cannon facing down the trench. One cannon shot killed 48 men, and he was basically knocked, knocked out by the head of one of his comrades. Um, insane. Again, the way he writes it, wait, I'm sorry if it's cut, uh, the story seems quite uh, bitty, but the way he writes it, it's like it's almost like a list just with commas, and it's just very um, matter of fact. So basically, when McBain retired from the army, he moved to London, where he opened a, a school for teaching sword fighting, teaching self defense in general with many weapons. And he also opened a, an ale house. And when he was in London, he fought prize fights at a place called the Bear Garden. Um, and this is where we have most of the historical records about his life. Is actually like advertisements, like newspaper advertisements about uh, prize fights that were happening. So we knew that he was fighting there. And he fought a total of 37 prize fights. In the beer gardens. Substantial. Substantial, exactly. And this was him, you know, after a whole career in the military. Um, and he was in his, his early 60s in his last fight. And uh, I think it's fitting, since Paul MacDonald told the story of his first ever duel. We've got Paul MacDonald once again telling the story of his last duel. Take it away, Paul. I think the account of his last duel is, is really quite telling. Um, a man in his 60s against an Irishman in his 20s, by the sword, trial of skill, public stage, in Where Edinburgh. He was in his 60s. Aye, he was. He was, he was up in years against a young lad. Um, and yeah, that happened just along the road here, at Holyrood, 23rd of June, 1726. Um, and that story in itself, and that he had to cut the boy again and again and again, didn't receive a single cut himself. It cut him seven times about the body, broke his arm. You know, can you imagine the crowd going wild, especially those that gambled in favour of Donald McBain? <laughs> I mean, a lot of money changing hands that day, but that, that story in itself is, is something else. And, but on a deeper level as well, because I think McBain saw his younger, fiery self in that Irishman, and he says at the end of it that it was his last duel, but not because he lost it. It was his last duel because he chose to hang up his sword after that and commit his life to God, he said. Yeah. You know, so something quite deep and telling in that yeah. too. So there you go, folks. There's a bunch of some of our favourite stories. There's many more in this book. I recommend getting this book. So there's one other story that we didn't share in this video. That's one of our favourites. And it's a, it's a story of how Donald McBain fought seven, seven men armed with, armed with swords. Seven swords versus one. Yeah. And we will be telling that story in the next video. And not only will we tell the story, but we'll show you exactly how he did it. And this is one of the workshops that we did in the McBain event. But I hope you enjoyed the stories that we shared today. These are just some of our favourites in this book. I recommend getting this book. Perhaps to best end it is to get some advice from Donald McBain. <laughs> And this is his advice, he closes one of his chapters. To avoid those desperate combats, my advice is for all gentlemen to take a hearty cup and to drink friends to avoid trouble. <laughs> Slash of that. Slash of that. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. 
join us on the Patreon page if you want extra content. And yeah, we'll, we'll see you in the next video where we'll show you how to fight seven guys with swords.